Hey everyone, so this is going to be one of the first videos I'm making to start reading the lore, since I would like to know about the areas that I'm about to adventure in as I begin adventuring in them, but this is a good enough place as any to start that. So we're going to pop up our journal, we're going to go over to our codex section, and start reading some of the stuff that we picked up. We have two characters, three in Magic and Religion, and four in Creatures. So this is good, this playlist, and starting with this video, it's just going to be me reading the lore from time to time. And eventually, once I have about 30 minutes of it total, I'll begin adding videos to this playlist. So let's go ahead and start. So let's take a look at our creatures. What do we fight out there? In the Fade. A rage Demon. Encountered in the Fade, the true form of a Rage Demon is a frightening sight. A thing of pure fire. Its body seemingly made of amorphous lava, and its eyes two pinpricks of baleful light radiating from its core. The abilities of such a demon center on the fire it generates. It burns those who come near, and the most powerful of its kind are able to lash out with bolts of fire, and even firestorms that can affect entire areas. Fortunately, even powerful rage demons are less intelligent than most other varieties. Their tactics are simple, attack an enemy on sight with as much force as possible until it perishes. Some rage demons carry over their heat-based abilities into possessed hosts, but otherwise, the true form is mostly seen outside of the Fade when it's specifically summoned by a mage to do his bidding. And how about that sloth demon that we failed the riddle for? Well, we have a quote at first. And I looked at the creature, and it became me. A vertebral copy of my form, of my very mind, stared back at me, as if from within a mirror. I thought surely that this was a trick, an illusion meant to put me off guard. But as I engaged the thing with my sword, it fought me with maneuvers that I recognize. It parried as I parried. It swung as I swung. It spoke to me and said things that only I could know. I... I think this demon of sloth has no form or identity of its own. It is envy as much as sloth, I believe, and mine was not the first shape it stole that day. An excerpt from a transcribed disposition of Tinrius, Templar Commander of Cumberland, 930 Towers. The most difficult assumption for some who study demons is to overcome the notion that a sloth demon is, in of itself, slothful. If that were so, it seems highly unlikely any such demons would cross the veil into our own world, or once here, would fight to possess any creature with a will of its own. And we know both of these things are not the case. Certainly some demons are lazy and complacent, but who knows, perhaps these creatures even cultivate such repu repu reputation. The truth is that demons of sloth are named so because this is the portion of the human psyche that they feed upon. Doubt, apathy, entropy. They seek to spread these things. The sloth demon hides in its forms, a master of shapes and disguises, always in the last place you look. And from its hiding place, it spreads its influence. A community affected by a demon of sloth could soon become dilapidated a dilapidated pit where injustices are allowed to pass without comment and none of the residents would be aware that such a change has even taken place. The sloth demon weakens, tires, tears at the edges of consciousness, and would much rather render its victims helpless than engage in a true conflict. Such creatures are best faced only with a great deal of will, and only with an eye to piercing their many disguises. How about a wisp? A great deal is made of the most powerful demons, those that create abominations and those that have changed the history of Thetis. It is often forgotten that not all demons are such awe-inspiring beings. Some that break through the cracks and to veil to our own world are known as wisps, a sliver of a thought that once was. A wisp is a demon that has lost its power, either it has existed in our world for far too long without finding a true host, or it has been destroyed, often so we found by other demons. What remains of its mind clings tightly to the one concept that created it, a hatred of all things living. While its ability to target a living creature is limited, these wisps are often mindlessly attacked when en encountered in the Fade. <coughs> Excuse me. In the living world, they often have known to maliciously lure the living into dangerous areas, being mistaken for lanterns or other civilized light sources. This does, however, seem to be the very limit of their cunning. From the journal of former senior enchanter Malus, once of the Circle of Rivian, declared apostate in 920 Dragon Age. And the wolf. Oh wow, okay, so the spirit wolves just got as normal wolves as well. It is rather unfair, the reputation that the wolf possesses in Ferelden. For a people that so clearly adore their hounds, Ferelden simultaneously harbor a distrust of wolves that borders on the unreasonable. 
Unreasonable, that is, if one were not familiar with the ancient legends regarding werewolves. There was a time in Ferelden's past where demons inhabited the bodies of wolves in great numbers, causing the wars against werewolves and the spreading great fear and panic. The werewolves were slain, but even today the noble wolf is still looked upon with distrust. From Legends of Ferelden, by Mother Alias of Denerim, 910 Dragon. An attack by wolves upon civilized folk happens rarely, often only in times of desperation, and even then, only when the wolves have the advantage of numbers. This can change during a blight, when dark spawn rise onto the surface of their presence. Their presence dramatically alters the savage nature of normal beasts. In blights past, as the corruption of the dark spawn spread through the wilder areas of Thetis, it would infect the animals found there, and the more powerful of them would survive and be transformed into a more vicious and dangerous beast. A blight wolf is one such example, mad with the pain of its infection, and only through the overriding command of the dark spawn does it retain some semblance of its pack instincts. Blight wolves are always found in large groups, and will tend to overwhelm a single target, if they can, using their numbers to their advantage. It is fortunate that these creatures rarely survive their corruption for very long. Awesome. And how about magic and religion? The Black City. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible, always far off, for it seems that the only rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. The chant teaches that the Black City was once the seat of the Maker, from whence he ruled the Fade, left empty when men turned away from him. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful Magister Lords from the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black, which was perhaps the least of their worries. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons, by Enchanter Midromiel. And we've already read the Howring, I believe. So let's read Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons. It is, a challenge, it is challenging enough for the casual observer to tell the difference between the Fade and the creatures that live within it, let alone between one type of spirit and another. In truth, there is little that distinguishes them, even for the most astute mages. Since spirits are not physical entities, and are therefore not restricted to recognizable forms, or even having a form at all, one can never tell for certain what is alive and what is merely part of the scenery. It is therefore advisable for the inexperienced researcher to greet all objects he encounters. Typically, we misuse the term spirit to refer only to the benign, or at least the less malevolent creatures of the Fade, but in truth, all the den Denzians, denizens of the realm beyond the Veil are spirits. As the Chant of Light notes, everything within the Fade is a mimicry of our own, a poor imitation, for the spirits do not remotely understand what they are copying. It is no surprise that much of the Fade appears like a manuscript translated from the Tenventer into Orlesian and back again by drunken initiates. Okay, so basically the demons we encounter are unfamiliar with physical form, but they see us in it and take, the, take those shapes, I suppose. In general, spirits are not complex, or rather, they are not com complex as we understand such things. Each one seizes upon a single facet of human experience, rage, hunger, compassion, hope, etc. This one idea becomes their identity. We classify as demons those spirits who identify themselves with darker human emotions and ideas. The most common and weakest form of demon one encounters in the Fade is the Rage Demon. They are much like perpetually boiling kettles, where they exist only to vent hatred, but rarely have an object to hate. Somewhat above these are the Hunger Demons, who do little but eat or attempt to eat everything they encounter, including other demons. This is rarely successful. Then there are the Sloth Demons. These are the first intelligent creatures one typically finds in the Fade. They are dangerous only on those rare occasions when they can be induced to get up and do harm. Desire Demons are more clever, and far more powerful, using all forms of bribery to induce mortals into their realms, wealth, love, vengeance, whatever lies closest to your heart. The most powerful demons yet encountered are the Pride Demons, perhaps because they, among all their kind, most resemble men. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons, by Enchanter Midromiel. And characters? Knight Commander Gregor. 
Your magic is a gift, but it is also a curse. The Circle of Magi has trained you, and we Templars of the Chantry stand vigil to ensure that training is adequate. And first Enchanter Ivory. If you want to survive, you must learn the rules and realize that sometimes, sacrifices are necessary. Hey everyone, I'm back and let's read a little bit more lore, because we have a little bit more uncovered so far. So, let's... wow! Okay, we've quite a bit recovered. Let's go ahead and read more magic and religion. So we've already read the Black City. So let's go to the Chant of Light, the Blight. No matter their power, their triumphs, the mage lords of Deventer were men, and doomed to die. Then a voice whispered within their hearts, Shall you surrender your power to time like the beasts of the fields? You are the lords of the earth. Go forth to claim the empty throne of heaven and be gods. In secret they worked, magic upon magic. All their power and all their vanity, they turned against the veil, until at last it gave way. Above them, a river of light. Before them, the throne of heaven, waiting. Beneath their feet, the footprints of the Maker. And all around them echoed a vast silence. But when they took a single step toward the empty throne, a great voice cried out, shaking the very foundations of heaven and earth. And so is the golden city blackened with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven and doom upon all the world. Violently they were cast down, for no mortal may walk boldly in the realm of dreams, oh bodily, I'm sorry, in the realm of dreams, bearing the mark of their crime, bodies so maimed and distorted that none should see them and know them for men. Deep into the earth they fled, away from the light. In darkness eternal they searched for those who had goaded them on, until at last they found their prize, their god, their betrayer, the sleeping dragon Dumat. Their taint twisted even the false god, and the whisperer awoke at last in pain and horror, and led them to wreak havoc upon all the nations of the world. The First Blight From Threnodes Eight. We also have the Maker here. Let's see about, I guess this would be the equivalent of the High Father, or God, or what have you. There was no word for heaven or for earth, for sea or sky. All that existed was silence. Then the voice of the Maker rang out, the first word, and his word became all that might be. Dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities, and from it made his firstborn and he said to them, In my image I forge you. To you I gave dominion over all that exists. By your will may all things be done. Then in the center of heaven he called forth a city with towers of gold, streets with music for cobblestones, and banners which flew without end. There he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. The children of the Maker gathered before his golden throne and sang hymns of praise unending, like their songs were the songs of the cobblestones. They shone with the golden light reflected from the Maker's throne. They held forth the banners that flew on their own. And the voice of the Maker shook the fade, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given, been given dominion over all that exists. By your will, all things are done. Yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. And he knew he had wrought amiss. So the Maker turned from his firstborn, and took from the Fade a measure of its living flesh, and placed it apart from the spirits and spoke to it, saying, Here I decree opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light. By my will alone is balance sundered, and the world given new life. And no longer was it formless, ever changing, but held fast immutable, with words for heaven and for earth, sea and sky. At last did the Maker from the living world make men, immutable, as the substance of the earth, with souls made of dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. Then the Maker said, To you, my second-born, I grant this gift. 
and your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all-consuming and never satisfied. From the Fade I crafted you, and to the Fade you shall return, each night in dreams, that you may always remember me. And then the Maker sealed the gates of the Golden City, and there he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. Threnodes 5, 1, 8 The Founding of the Chantry Cordelius Dracon, king of the city-state of Orleus, was a man of uncommon ambition. In the year negative fifteen ancient, the young king began construction of a great temple dedicated to the Maker, and declared that by its completion he would not only have united the warring city-states of the south, he would have brought Andrastian belief to the world. In negative three ancient, the temple was completed. There, in its heart, Dracon knelt before the eternal flame of Andraste, and was crowned ruler of the Emperor of or Orlalius. His first act as emperor to declare the Chantry as the established Andrastian religion of the Empire. It took three years and several hundred votes before Olesa of Montezumard was elected to lead the new Chantry. Upon her coronation as divine, she took the name Justina in honor of the disciple who recorded Andraste's songs. In that moment, the ancient era ended, and the Divine Age began. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar. We have the Malficarium. It has been asked, what are Malficarium? How shall we know them? I have been as troubled by this question as you. You have come to me for the wisdom of the Maker, but none have seen the Maker's heart, save beloved Andraste. And so I have done as all mortals must, and looked to the words of his prophet for answers, and there I found respite from a troubled mind. For she has said to us, Magic exists to serve man, and never to rule over him. Therefore I say to you, they who work magic which dominates the minds and hearts of others, they have transgressed the Maker's law. Also Our Lady said to us, those who bring harm without provocation to the least of his children are hated and accursed by the Maker. And so it is made clear to me, as it should be to us all, that magic which fuels itself by harming others, by letting of blood, is hated by the Maker. Those mages who honor the Maker and keep his laws we welcome as our brothers and sisters. Those who reject the laws of the Maker and the words of his prophet are apostate. They shall be cast out and given no place among us. From the servants of Justina the First. We also have Blood Magic, the Forbidden School. Might be something they'll read since we're, that's apparently something going on here. Foul and corrupt you are, who have taken my gift and turned it against my children. Transfigurations, 1810. The ancient Tevinters did not originally consider Blood Magic a school of its own. Rather, they saw it as a means to achieve greater power in any school of magic. The name, of course, refers to the fact that magic of this type uses life, specifically in the form of blood instead of mana. It was common practice, at one time, for a magister to keep a number of slaves on hand so that, should he undertake the working of a spell that was physically beyond his abilities, he could use the blood of his slaves to bolster the casting. Over time, however, the Imperium discovered types of spells that could only be worked by blood. Although Lyrum will allow a mage to send his conscious mind into the Fade, blood will allow him to find the sleeping minds of others view their dreams, and even influence or dominate their thoughts. Just as treacherous blood magic allows the veil to be opened completely so that demons may physically pass through it into our world, the rise of the Chant of Light and subsequent fall of the Old Imperium has led to blood magic being all but stamped out, as it should be, for it poses nearly a greatest danger to those who would practice it, as to the world at large. From the Four Schools, a triest by First Enchanter Josephus. We have one more we haven't read in this, the Tranquil. Although apprentices do not know the nature of the harrowing, all of them understand its consequences. They either pass and become full mages, or they are never seen again. Those who fear to undertake the rite of patches, or those who are deemed too weak or unstable, are given the rite of trans trans tranquility instead. The actual procedure, like the harrowing, is secret, but the results are just as well known. The right severs the connection to the Fade. The Tranquil, therefore, do not dream. This removes the greatest danger that threatens a weak or unprepared mage, the potential to attract demons across the Veil. But this is the least of the Tranquility's effects, for the absence of dreams brings with it the end of all magical ability, as well as all emotion. 
that Tranquil, ironically, resemble sleepwalkers. Never entirely awake nor asleep, they are still part of our circle, however, and some might say they are the most critical part. They have incredible powers of concentration, for it is simply impossible to distract a tranquil mage, and this makes them capable of becoming craftsmen of such skill that they rival even the adeptness of the dwarves. The Formari, the branch of the circle devoted to item enchantment, is made up exclusively of tranquil, and it is the source of all the wealth that sustains our towers. From On Tranquility and the Role of the Fade in Human Society by First Enchanter Josephus. Or Yo Josephus. Looks like we have a two here in culture and history. The Grey Wardens. Their first blight had already raged for 90 years. The world was in chaos. A god had arisen, twisted and corrupted. The remaining gods of Tevinter were silent, withdrawn. What writing we have recovered from those times is filled with despair, for everyone believed from the greatest archons to the lowliest slaves that the world was coming to an end. At Weishup Fortress in the desolate Anderfalls, a meeting transpired. Soldiers of the Imperium, seasoned veterans who had known nothing their entire lifetimes except hopeless war, came together. When they left Weishup, they had renounced their oaths up to the Imperium. They were soldiers no longer. They were the Grey Wardens. The Wardens began an aggressive campaign against the Blight, striking back against the Darkspawn, reclaiming lands given up for lost. The Blight was far from over. But their victories brought notice, and soon they received aid from every nation in Thetis. As they grew in number as well as reputation, finally in the year 992 of the Tevinter Imperium, upon the Silent Plains, they met the Archdemon Dumat in battle. A third of all the armies of northern Thetis were lost to the fighting, but Dumat fell, and the Darkspawn fled back underground. Even that was not the end. The Imperium once revered seven gods, Dumat, Zakiel, Toth, and Doral, Razakael, Luthiscan, and a name I cannot possibly pronounce. Four have risen as Arc Demons. The Grey Wardens have kept watch through the ages, well aware that peace is fleeting, and that their war continues until the last of the dragon gods is gone. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. We have another one here. Darkspawn. Those who have sought to claim heaven by violence destroyed it. What was golden and pure turned black. Those who had once been mage lords, the brightest of their age, were no longer men, but monsters. Threnodes 12.1 Sin was the midwife that ushered the darkspawn into this world. The magisters fell from the golden city, and their fate encompassed all our worlds, for they were not alone. No one knows where the darkspawn came from. A dark mockery of men, in the darkest places they thrive, growing in numbers as a plague of locusts will. In raids, they often take captives, dragging their victims alive into the deep roads, but most evidence suggests that these are eaten. Like spiders, it seems Darkspawn prefer their food still breathing. Perhaps they are simply spawned by the darkness. Certainly we know that evil has no trouble perpetuating itself. The last blight was in the Age of Towers, striking once again at the heart of Tevinter, spreading south into or or Laius, and east into the Free Marches. The plague spread as far as Ferelden, but the withering and twisting of the land stopped well beyond our borders. Here, Darkspawn have never been more than the stuff of legends. In the northern lands, however, particularly Tevinter and the Anderfalls, they say Darkspawn haunt the hinterlands, preying on outlying farmers and isolated villages, a constant threat. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. We have one new character here. Who is this? First Enchanter Ivering. A little bit more information about him. There is no higher office in the Circle Tower than that of First Enchanter. The one who holds this title must not only be an able administrator, but also a mentor, leader, and surrogate parent to all the mages of the Tower. Irving has proven himself to be all these things with an added dose of cunning. Most apprentices know that little goes on in the Tower that Irving does not know. He can soothe Templar's anger by some childish magic prank at the same time that he lauds the pranksters. Everyone walks away satisfied. Oh, that sounds very nice. We have another thing, actually. Knight Commander Gregor. Grim and Tacturn, Gregor has been the Knight Commander of the Templar forces stationed at the Circle Tower for so many years that hardly anyone except the First Enchanter recalls that he is not simply a part of the Tower itself. <laughs> Alright, everyone, that's all the lore so far. Let me go back to playing the game. Hey, everyone. We just arrived in Ostagar, and it's time for some more lore. Let's go ahead and start reading some more of this stuff. 
So, we have, wow, all right, we're gonna have a lot to read here, so probably looking at 20 minutes or so. Well, here we go. So, let's start looking at our characters. Who else do we have? So, we just met King Kalen Therian. I had hoped for a war like in the tales, a king riding with the fabled Grey Wardens against a tainted god. Son of the legendary King Marek Theron, Kaelin was the first Ferelden king born into a land free from foreign rule in two generations. Since his father's death, he's held the throne alongside his queen, Honora, and Logan, Logain Mokhtir. It takes more than legends to win a battle. Loghain was born a farmer during a time when his country was under foreign occupation. When he was still a boy, he joined the Resistance, where his considerable tactical genius quickly became apparent. He became close friends with Prince Marek, the last true heir to the Ferelden throne, and together they led the rebels to drive out the forces of the Orlais Empire. Marek raised his friend to the nobility, and Loghain is now more of a symbol than of a man. He represents the Ferelden ideals of hard work and independence. Culture and History The Tevinter Imperium The Imperium is little more than a dilapidated old slantern crouching in the far north of Thetis, drunkenly cursing at passerbys to recall her faded beauty. One can see that Mithrandius was once the center of the world. The vestiges of her power and artistry yet stand. But they are buried in the layers of filth that the Imperium's decadence had accumulated over the ages. The Megocracy live in elegant stone towers, literally elevated above the stench of the slaves and peasants below. The outskirts of Marathis are awash in a sea of refugees turned destitute by the never-ending war between the Imperium and the Quinari. And yet, the Imperium survives. Whether with sword or magic, Tevinter remains a force to be reckoned with. Minranthius has been besieged by men, by Quinari, by Andraste herself, and never fallen. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, by Brother Ginevinti. The Kokari Wild will be going to these soon, I think. It is said that in the midst of the Black Age, when the werewolves stalked the lands of Ferelden in numbers that kept every farmholder indoors and a hound on every doorstep, a powerful arl of the... Al Alamari peoples stood and declared that he would put an end to the threat. His Arling stood on the border of the Dark Forest on the southern border of Ferelden Valley, and he claimed that the werewolves used the forest to launch their midnight assaults on humanity. For twenty years, this Arl led an army of warriors and hounds deep into the forest. In his hunt for the werewolves, he slew not only every wolf he came upon, but also every member of the Chazid Wilder Folk. Any one of them, he said, could harbor a demon inside, and thus be a werewolf in disguise. For twenty years the forest rang with screams and the rivers ran red. The tales say that an old chastened woman found her sons all dead at the Arl's blades. She pulled one of those very blades from her own son heart and plunged it into her own chest, cursing the Arl's name as she did so. Where her blood touched the ground, a mist began to rise. It spread and spread until it was everywhere in the forest. The Arl's army became lost, and it is said that they died there. Others say they wander still. The ruins of his Arling stand to this day, filled with the ghosts of women waiting eternally for their husbands to return. The forest of the legend is, of course, the Kakari Wilds. There are as many legends about the Great Southern Forest that there are shadows, or so the saying goes. The Chasnan Wilder folk have made their home there since mankind first came to these lands, and the wildlands spread as far into the south as anyone has ventured. Beyond the mists are vast tracts of snow, white-capped mountains, and entire fields of ice. It is a land too cold for mankind to survive, yet the Chasnan eke out an existence even there, and they tell of horrors beyond the wilds that the lowland folk could not begin to comprehend. For most, Ferelden simply ends with the Kokari Wilds. There was nothing beyond. The wilds is a land of great trees, wet marshes, and dangerous monsters. What more need be said? From Lands of the Wilders, by Mother Alias, Chantry Scholar, 918 Dragon. Lots of magic and religion to read, so here we go. 
the Aonar. When the Imperium occupied the area that is present-day Ferelden, they had two sites dedicated to magical experimentation at the extreme ends of the Imperium, Imperial Highway. The southern one was the Fortress of Ostagar, which looked out over the Kokari Wilds. The northern one was Aonar, although the exact location is now a secret known only to a handful of Templars. Whatever it was that the Vinter were trying to discover at Aonar, their work was never completed. The fortress was overrun by disciples of Andraste upon hearing the news of her death. According to legend, it was a massacre, eerily silent, for the invaders caught the mages while all but one of them were in the Fade. The site was left structurally sound but spiritually damaged. Possibly because of this, the Chantry chose to put it to use as a prison. Accused Malficarium and apostates are held within the confines of Aonar. Those who have powerful connections to the Fade, and particularly to demons, will inevitably attract something across the Veil, making the guilty somewhat easier to tell from the innocent. From Of Fires, Circles, and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Andraste, Bride of the Maker. There was once a tiny filling vill fishing village on the Waking Sea that was set upon by the Tevinter Imperium, which enslaved the villagers to be sold in the markets of Maranthius, leaving behind only the old and the infirm. One of the captives was the child Andraste. She was raised in slavery in a foreign land. She escaped and made the long and treacherous journey back to her homeland alone. She rose from nothing to be the wife of an Alamari warlord. Each day she sang to the gods, asking them to help her people who remained slaves into Vinter. The false gods of the mountains and the winds did not answer her, but the true god did. The Maker spoke. He showed her all the works of his hands, the Fade, the world, and all the creatures therein. He showed her how men had forgotten him, lavishing devotion upon mute idols and demons, and how he had left them to their fate. But her voice had reached him, and so captivated him that he offered her a place at his side, that she might rule all of creation. But Andraste would not forsake her people. She begged the Maker to return, to save his children from the cruelty of the Imperium. Reluctantly, the Maker agreed to give man another chance. Andrasse went back to her husband, Mafareth, and told him all that the Maker had revealed to her. Together, they rallied the Alamari and marched forth against the mage lords of the Imperium, and the Maker was with them. The Maker's sword was creation itself, fire and flood, famine and earthquake. Everywhere they went, Andraste sang to the people of the Maker, and they heard her. The ranks of Andraste's followers grew until there were a vast tide washing over the Imperium, and when Mafareth saw that the people loved Andraste and not him, a worm grew inside within his heart, gnawing upon it. At last, the armies of Andraste and Mafareth stood before the very gates of Minrathius, but Andraste was not with them. For Mafareth had schemed in secret to hand Andraste over to the Tevinter. For this, the Archon would give Mafareth all the lands to the south of the Waking Sea. And so, before all the armies of the Alamari and of Tevinter, Andraste was tied to a stake and burned while her earthly husband turned his armies aside and did nothing. For his heart had been devoured. But as he watched the pyre, the Archon softened. He took pity on Andraste and drew his sword and granted her the mercy of a quick death. The Maker wept for his beloved, cursed Mafareth, cursed mankind and their betrayal, and turned once again from creation, taking only Andraste with him. And Our Lady sits still at his side, where she still urges him to take pity on his children. From the Sermons of Justina II. Right of Annulment. In the 83rd year of the Glory Age, one of the mages of Nuvarin's circle was found practicing forbidden magic. The Templars executed him swiftly, but this brewed discontent among the Nuvara circle. The mages made several magical attacks against the Templars, vengeance for the executed mage, but the knight commander was unable to track down which were responsible. Three months later, the mages summoned a demon and turned it loose against their Templar watchers. Demons, however, are not easily controlled. After killing the first wave of Templars who tried to contain it, the demon took possession of one of its summoners. The resulting abomination slaughtered Templars and mages both before escaping into the countryside. The Grand Cleric sent a legion of Templars to hunt the fugitive. They killed the abomination a year later, but by that time it had slain seventy people. Divine Galatee 
responding to the catastrophe in Navarre and hoping to prevent further incidents, granted all the Grand Clerics of the Chantry the power to purge a circle entirely if they rule it irredeemable. This rite of annulment has been performed 17 times in the last 700 years. From Of Fire, Circles, and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Wow, they wiped out entire circles. How about that? The Fraternity of Enchanters. Another aspect of circle life is a fraternity. When a mage becomes an enchanter, he may ally himself with the fraternity. These are cl cliques that cross circle boundaries. Mages of common interests and goals who band together to ensure that their voice is heard within a the College of Magi in Cumberland. The largest fraternities currently are the Loyalists, who advocate loyalty and obedience to the Chantry. The Aquitarians, who advocate temperance and follow a strict code of contact which they believe all mages should hold to themselves. Oh, sorry, should hold themselves to. The Libertarians, a growing fraternity, publicly maintaining greater power for the circles, but secretly advocating complete split from the Chantry. A dangerous opinion, naturally. The Isolationists, a small group of that advocates withdrawing to remote territories in order to avoid conflicts with the general populace. The Lucrosians, who maintain that the circle must do what is profitable first and foremost. They prioritize the accumulation of wealth, with the gaining of political influence a close second. So far, an alliance between the Loyalists and the Aquitarians have prevented Libertarians from gaining much headway, but there are signs that the Aquitarians may throw their support in with the Libertarians. If that happens, Many mages predict it will come to civil war among the circles. From the Circle of Magi, a history by first enchanter Yosephus. Hierarchy of the Circle It is no simple matter safeguarding ordinary men from mages and mages from themselves. Each circle tower must have some measure of self-government, for it is ever the maker's will that men be given the power to take responsibility for our own actions to sin and fail, as well as to achieve the highest grace and glory of our own strength. You, who will be tasked with the protection of the circle, must be aware of its workings. The first enchanter is the heart of any tower. He will determine the course his circle will take. He will choose which apprentices may be tested and made full mages, and you will work most closely with him. Assisting the first enchanter will be the senior enchanters, a small council of the most trusted and experienced magi in the tower. From this group, the next first enchanter is always chosen. Beneath the council are the enchanters. These are teachers and mentors of the tower, and you must get to know them in order to keep your finger on the pulse of the circle, for the enchanters will always know what is happening among the children. All of those who have passed their harrowing, but have not taken the apprentices, uh, yeah, that's right, but have not, I'm sorry, I mean, sorry everyone. All who have passed their harrowing, but have not taken apprentices, are mages. This is where most trouble in the circle lies, the idleness and inexperience of youth. The untested apprentices are the most numerous desians of any tower, but they are more often pose threats to themselves due to their lack of training than to anyone else. Knight Commander Syrian of the Chantry Templars in a letter to his successor, or Serene. Knight Commander Serene. History of the Circle. It is a truth universally acknowledged that nothing is more successful at inspiring a person to mischief as being told not to do something. Unfortunately, the Chantry of the Divine Age had some trouble with obvious truths. Although it did not outlaw magic, quite the contrary, as the Chantry relied upon magic to kindle the internal flame which burns in every bazaar and every Chantry, it regulated mages to lighting candles and lamps, perhaps occasional dusting of rafters and eaves. I will give my readers a moment to contemplate how well such a role satisfied the mages of the time. It surprised absolutely no one when the mages of Val Royaux, Royal, Royal, I can't pronounce this word. Val Royal, we'll call it. I don't know how to pronounce it. I apologize. In protest, snuffed the sacred flames of the cathedral and barricaded themselves inside the choir loft. No one, that is, but the divine Ambrosia II, who was outraged and attempted to order an exalted march upon her own cathedral. Even her most devout Templars discouraged that idea. For 21 days, the fires remained unlit when negotiations were conducted, legends tell us, by shouting back and forth from the loft. The mages went cheerily into exile in a remote fortress outside of the capital, where they would be kept under the watchful eye of the Templars and the counsel of their own elder magi. Outside of normal society and outside of the Chantry, 
the mages would form their own closed society, the Circle, separated for the first time in human history. From A Fire, Circles, and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Okay, so this kind of sounds like the isolationists' original view, in order to keep themselves separate from everyone else, not be bothered. I guess the Chantry really punished the, the mages in the past. The Cardinal Rules of Magic you must not be under the misimpression that magic is all-powerful. There are limits, and not even the greatest mages may overcome them. No one, for instance, has found any means of traveling, either over great distances or small ones, beyond putting one foot in front of the other. The immutable nature of the physical world prevents this, so no, you may not simply pop over to Mithranthus to borrow a cup of sugar, nor may you magic the essay you forgot in the apprentice dormitory to your desk. You will simply have to be prepared. Similarly, even when you send your mind into the Fade, your body remains behind. Only once has this barrier been overcome, and reputedly the spell required two-thirds of the lyrium in the Tevinter Imperium, as well as the lifeblood of several hundred slaves. The results were utterly disastrous. That would probably be the spawning of the dark spawn, according to the legend. Finally, life is finite. A truly great healer may bring someone back from the very precipice of death, when breath and heartbeat have ceased, but the spirit still clings to life. But once the spirit has fled the body, it cannot be recalled. That is no failing of your skills or power. It is simple reality. From the lectures of First Enchanter Wenceslas. Four Schools of Magic. Creation. Opposition in all things. For earth, sky. For winter, summer. For darkness, light. By my will alone is balance sundered, and the world given new life. Throne of Deeds 5.5 The school of creation, sometimes called the school of nature, is the second of the schools of matter, the balancing force of the and complement of entropy. Creation magic manipulates natural forces, transforming what exists and bringing new things into being. Creation requires considerable finesse, more than any other school, and is therefore rarely mastered. Those mages who have made a serious study of creation are the highest in demand, useful in times of peace as well as war. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. Let's read about Entrophy. To you, my second-born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all-consuming and never satisfied. Front of these, 5-7. The second of the two schools of matter, Entrophy is the opposing force of creation. For this reason, it is often called the school of negation. Nothing lives without death. Time inevitably brings an end to all things in the material world, and yet in this ending is a seed of a beginning. A river may flood its banks, causing havoc, but bring new life to its floodplain. The fire that burns a forest ushers in new growth. And so it is with entrophic magic that we manipulate the forces of erosion, decay, and destruction to create anew. From the four schools, a treaty by First Enchanter Josephus. The Four Schools of Magic Primal. Those who oppose thee shall know the wrath of heaven. Field and forest shall burn. The sea shall rise and devour them. The wind shall tear their nations from the face of the earth. The lightning shall rain down from the sky. They shall cry out to their false gods and find silence. Andraste 719. Sometimes called the school of power, the primal school is the second of the schools of energy, balanced by spirit, and concerns the most visible and tangible forces of nature itself. This is the magic of war, fire, ice, and lightning, devastation. This is what the vast majority imagines when they hear the, world ma the word magic. From the four schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus, we have one more of these to read, and I'll be it for the magic and religion section. The Four Schools of Magic Spirit. And the voice of the Maker shook the Fade, saying, In my image I have wrought, my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will all things are done, yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. Frenodes 5-4 The first of the two schools of energy, Spirit is opposed to the primal school. It is the school of mystery, the inferior school. This is the study of the invisible energies which surround us at all times, yet are outside of nature. 
It is from the Fate itself that this magic draws its power. Students of this school cover everything from direct manipulation of mana and spell energies to the study and summoning of spirits themselves. By its nature, the esoteric school, as most others know virtually nothing about the Fade, studies of spirit magic are often misunderstood by the general populace, or even confused for blood magic, an unfortunate fate for a most useful branch of study. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Yosephus. And we have a bunch of creatures to read. Or do we? Oh, I'm sorry, we have... We have three. Okay. So, the Arc Demon. In darkness eternal they searched for those who had goaded them on, until at last they found their prize, their god, their betrayer, the sleeping dragon Dumat. Their taint twisted even the false god, and the whisperer awoke at last in pain and horror, and led them to wreak havoc upon all the nations of the world. The first blight. I know these, 8-7. I, I like reading these quotes before I read the actual text, because we've read these before, and so it, it actually gives us a little bit of... So looking for history, I suppose. Or the proper frame of mind in which to read these. The false god the, the I'm sorry, the false dragon gods of the Tevinter Imperium lie buried deep within the earth, where they have been imprisoned since the maker cast them down. No one knows what it is that drives the darkspawn in their relentless search for the sleeping old gods, perhaps his instinct as moss will fly into torch flames. Perhaps there is some remnant of desire for, village, for vengeance upon the ones who goaded the Magisters to assault heaven. Whatever the reason, when Darkspawn find one of these ancient dragons, it is immediately afflicted by the taint. It awakens, twisted and corrupted, and leaves the Darkspawn in a full-scale invasion of the land of Blight. Deepstalkers. A fool trusts his eyes. A wise man fears every rock as a Deepstalker. Dwarven saying. Possibly the strangest of all creatures found in the deep roads is the deep stalker. Tis pandem, as the dwarves call them, hunt in packs generally by bur burrowing underground and then striking when their prey is in their midst. Stalkers come in several types. Spitters have venom glands and can spit secretions that slow or injure their prey. Jumpers hurl themselves at their targets, knocking them down and making the kill easier. The most common variety scares its prey, leaving the unfortunate victim helpless against the rest of the pack. And a giant spider. Giant spiders tend to appear in old ruins and other places where the veil has become thin because of magical disturbances or a great number of deaths. Oh, that doesn't bode well for, what, for the tower. In such places, spirits and demons pass into the world of the living and attempt to take control over living beings, spiders among them. Not all scholars accept this explanation for the presence of these beasts, however. Some claim that the thinning veil allows magic to leak from the Fade, tainting such creatures as these spiders to transform into larger and more potent creatures than they ever would become naturally. While such spiders are known to possess powerful poisons and the ability to fling their webs at opponents in combat, studies of them have been few, and the full range of their abilities are unknown. Okay, everyone, that's all for this. Thank you for listening. We'll read more lore in the future. I will see you then.